Okay, um, let's reconvene. So our next speaker is Michael Quante, Professor of Practical Philosophy at the University of Münster. He's written extensively about Hegel and Marx and is the author of the book, Hegel's Concept of Action. Um, his talk today is titled, Marx's Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, Dimensions and Deficits. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I hope I can share the screen to show, show my slides. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to deliver my paper so far, but I try now to share. Um, have I got the license to do this? It, yes, you should be able to share. Okay. So I hope you can see this. Can I, someone give me a sign whether you can see my slides? Okay, thank you very much. So I try to be very brief that we have some more time for discussing my points here. And my title, I refer to this early manuscript of Marx, but in the end, I will try to identify the main lines, Hegel's Marx critique, uh, in Marx thinking has, and I uh, start now. The first is I will shortly remind you of my aims. Then I will distinguish different dimensions of uh, Marx's overall strategy with, in dealing with Hegel, showing some of the continuities and try to identify at least two deficits I think are crucial in this critique and relevant for Marx's own theory construction. When Marx deals with Hegel, the overall function is that he wants to understand his own times better than in identifying his own position um, in relation to Hegel. And he is um, always trying to distinguish different levels of it and gives different roles in referring to Hegel. Now, uh, this is, I think, important to have in mind. And when you refer to the main texts in which uh, Marx uses Hegel, as a starting or turning point to develop his own theory or to put it one step further, there is this early letter to his father in which he somehow says that starting to overcome Hegel has been his aim and he fails. Uh, in some sense, probably this is also the, the end of the story. Um, but then we have this early text, uh, 1843, not published. He's that days um, in which he gives a commentary of some paragraphs and then in 1844 in the Paris manuscripts, philosophical and economic manuscripts, there are several passages in which Hegel is criticized and in the critical edition in the Mega, we have two variants of this uh, manuscripts from 1844. Uh, the one uh, which had been published in the beginning of the 20th century, the editors decided to put all the paragraphs dealing with uh, Marx's critique of Hegel together. And in the mega, that the, in that times they decided because that had been such a prominent text uh, in the 20th century to publish this version in the volume, but they knew that this is not the correct editorially spoken uh, version of it. So in the mega volume, you also find the second version, which is much closer to the original manuscripts. And there you do not have this Hegel excurse because it is uh, put together from different parts. And these different parts are related to different 
context in the other manuscripts and sometimes it is important to see which is the starting point when Marx tries to unfold an argument and then he starts thinking about Hegel. It gives the Hegel critique a little bit of different nuance by being contextualized again. And this um, same can be seen uh, in the Grundrisse, a manuscript from 1857-58, in which Marx also deals with Hegelian tools uh, more than criticizing Hegel, but there is a massive Hegelian structure in this Grundrisse, which uh, is relevant for understanding this program of critique of political economy. And um, in this can be seen, especially in the critical edition in the second section of MEGA. And then we have these uh, direct or indirect uh, reference to Hegel in the first volume of Capital from 1867. And in the second edition, which Marx himself prepared in 1871-72, where he also added uh, some comments on Hegel and he added footnotes in which he referred the reader to Hegel uh, to illustrate what he himself is, has been doing in the main text of Capital, especially in the conceptual starting uh, parts. To see this, because it's sometimes very hidden in the text, it is crucial to rely on the critical edition of the Marx text in its historical context. And this means we have to use the new mega edition because neither the older editions are available in German, nor the translation in English, as far as I could refer to them, is reliable here. Um, mostly in the English translation, the Hegelian heritages of a lot of Marxian concepts and arguments uh, simply vanishes away because the translators haven't been sensible for this dimension. His overall strategy is to use a critique of Hegel and the transformation of crucial Hegelian conceptions and theses as a medium to understand his own social reality. So in some sense, and that never stopped even when Marx was in London in exile later, and at least until middle of the 70s of the 19th century, that he always tried to locate his own thinking in his times and to understand his own times via approaching Hegel as a critical starting point. He never forgot and he actually in the second edition declared himself to be a scholar of this great philosopher that um, understanding Hegel's way of grasping his times is the apt starting point to analyze his own times. And this never was deleted or eliminated, although Marx also more and more referred to other kind of literature and empirical data, etc. A second strategy we find in him all the way down, that in developing his own conceptions, crucial for his own theory, he refers to concepts he finds in Hegel's philosophy and some main parts in Phenomenology of Spirit and in the Logic. And sometimes we can also see that um, he refers to some of Hegel's arguments in Hegel's uh, philosophy of right. And um, his doing it is, a, he has a kind of uh, standard Use applying to Hegel's uh, concepts, criticizing Hegel's concepts thereby, and justifying this way how he wants to do it. Um, sometimes he simply takes Hegel's concepts. And um, this is, for example, uh, one of the most important things 
in his notion of labor, which is also he, Marx's conception of action, he deeply relies on the basic model of action we find in Hegel directly. And this is not transformed in any sense uh, very deeply. If we analyze the structure, we can see that the notion of labor in Marx as seen from the perspective of a theory of action is a theory of objectification of intentions via a material process, the action event into a result in which this intention, this structure is realized or objectified. And we have to distinguish um, objectification from reification, for example. That's very important to understand Hegel and Marx when we come to realizing intentions and ends in action and failed realizations, which cause alienation. And the next thing is that Marx was persuaded that Hegel has made a, some deep philosophical mistakes, which are apt to mimic the alienated structure of reality. This is the Hegelian mistakes are not subjective mistakes of a philosopher, but are objective mistakes because the non-critical perspective on the given reality transforms or transfers the alienated structures of realities and the contradictions of realities into the conceptualized theory of this one. So Marx's dimension here is to say, when we know where this general mistake is, we can transform, like using a kind of algorithm, um, Hegelian's conceptions and bring them into the right structure to develop a critical theory. And then there is a new idea, which in, in some sense, um, Marx describes as an accident because he got uh, some copies of Hegel's uh, Werke, which had been owned by Bakunin years ago. And when he was trying to work out a whole version of his critique of political economy in the second half of 1850s, he was given these uh, books, former owned by Bakunin, and he started to reread the logic again and um, discovered that the Hegel's logic is a powerful tool to organize his own critique of political economy. Um, it's not that this idea is totally new that in that time, because even in the 1844 manuscripts with uh, reference to Hegel's logic, uh, Marx said, um, Hegel's logic is the money of spirit. And this is taken very literally, he thinks that the logic is in the same position to real labor. Sorry, the logic is in the same position to the reality as money is to real labor. So if real labor is alienated in its structure and logic is the alienated representation of reality, Logic has an analogous function as money has in, in an alienated society. And using this very early idea, it's from 1844, he rediscovers that describing a totally alienated structure with capitalism, the reality of its time, Hegel's logic is the right instrument to make this alienation visible. This is once more the basic idea that Hegel's mistakes are not subjective mistakes from a single philosopher, but are objectively caused mistakes because reality is alienated. There is a kind of symmetry condition operative here. And 
although a lot of people think that Marx uh, thinking philosophical and non-philosophical theorizing undergoes a, a sharp break somewhere between 1845-46 in terms of his critique of Hegel, we have a lot of continuities. And the in interesting thing, which I will try to work out in the paper later, is that the main aspects all are there in the 1843 manuscript uh, taken together with the Paris manuscripts, which have been written a few months later. What we always find are some Feuerbachian motives. Uh, in Feuerbach, Marx identifies two crucial features. The first is this critique of religion in which we have um, the mistake of exchanging the subject and the predicate, taking a dependent predicate as the real active sub uh, subject and vice versa. And we have the motive that self-understanding of humankind via religious attitudes is a kind of um, error theory, a mispredication, which has to be overcome by putting the subject in the predicate role and the predicate in the subject role. This is a kind of inversion structure that way. And finally, there are two more theses concerning Hegel, which Feuerbach established uh, aside his critique of religion. The first is that Hegel as an idealist is structurally similar to theology or religious, and so has to be dealt with as religion. This is, we have to criticize the way he organizes subject and predicate. The second is that Feuerbach wants to replace the Hegelian idealism by coming back to what he himself calls a kind of materialism and epistemically a kind of sensualism. Um, this last move, um, the sensualism is criticized by Marx. He is not following him in that position. But the idea that ontologically, the idealism of Hegel, which basically is taken to be the dependence of material things from mental or conceptual structures has to be turned around is somehow a starting point of Marx's thinking, although his notion of materialism is really uh, at least uh, oscillating or a multi-leveled concept which is not very clear. And it's also a problem that the op opponent, the idealism position, ascribed to Hegel um, is also a very simple one. So this is not a clear situation in terms um, of this meta categories, whether idealism or materialism is the right description of the overall ontological position. Um, and it is a lot of work to be done to better understand in which sense Marx is a materialist and in which sense Hegel is not and in which sense is Hegel an idealist and in which versions of idealism are not to be ascribed to Hegel. That's a very complicated issue, more complicated than in the debate between uh, Feuerbach, the left Hegelians and Marx himself has been worked out. And then there is a critique very early, which I want to emphasize because it's, it's seldom uh, identified as such, um, and Marx accuses Hegel with something I would call speculative positivism. And the basic idea of this is that Hegel in his Elements of Rights is doing two things. The first is he reduces a complex, historically contextually concrete social phenomena to a abstract conceptual structure developed in the logic. This means Hegel is reducing the historical concrete reality to a kind of 
abstract metaphysical conception. Hegel, for example, is accused not to understand the specific organismic structure of, of a state, but reducing the state to the concept of organism, which is a very abstract one to be found in the logic. This is the problem of um, reducing or abstracting the complexity of reality to work out some very abstract and general conceptions. The second also um, used in this area from Marxist's second objection, and this is that Hegel is sometimes misidentifying real phenomena as instantiations of some of his conceptions. And this is a different issue. He wants to say Hegel identifies a real phenomenon with a structure he has developed in his logic. And what he tries to do here is to say that this phenomena can be understood as instantiations of this structure, but he is mis identifying it, he takes, he uses the wrong candidates. So these are two essential early aspects having to do with the relation of concept and content of abstract, ahistorical conceptions and real socially historically bonded contexts and phenomena. What is a very famous phrase in the preface uh, of Marx's uh, description, how his theory is related to Hegel? He uses the German word umstülpen on the one hand and auf den Kopf stellen on the other hand. In the sentence, it seems to be as if this one is only an illustration of the second one, but as Fulda has worked out, uh, many, uh, 50 years ago, probably nearly 50 years ago, these two metaphors describe very different operations. This turning Hegel on, his, on the hat is a metaphor for replacing idealism by materialism as an ontological antithesis. It's like the thesis and its negation, a simple negation. If you turn something around, the top is now on the bottom and the other way around, but all the eternal relations between, for example, points on the surface of such a figure remain stable. The notion umstülpen in German means a very different, much more complicated operation. And this means to bring the inner side to the outside and the outer side to the inner side. If you imagine, if you have in mind, for example, a glove which is turned, not simply turned around, but put from in the inside out and the outside in. If you do that, you are not in this um, or dimension of top down or structure and superstructure, you are in the ontological categories of inner and outer, of essence and appearance, etc., which is also a very relevant conceptual uh, tool. Hegel, uh, um, Hegel's uh, heritage is to be found in Marx's capital. Even in the first sentence, the notion of appearance is used by Marx. Um, and all the way through, he is working with these uh, concepts in, of Hegel, Hegel's logic of essence with the inner and the outer. And he has uh, some complicated ideas, bringing Feuerbachian ideas into it that in Hegel, the outer has been identified with the uh, main subject position and the inner has been reduced to be the predicate only. This is a crucial element in the Marxian idea of replacing spirit by what he calls material spirit, um, species being in his philosophical anthropology to bring the real embodied human into the position of pure thinking, self-consciousness and spirit 
as it takes it, it is used in Hegel's logic to make consciousness a predicate of a material animal and not being an animal a predicate of, of consciousness, which is bringing the essence into the position of the only appearance or the ontologically robust one uh, and the basic one as the material species organismic life form of humans. These are very complicated uh, things. Um, Hegel theory is read by Marx and criticized by Marx to develop his own conceptions. His concept, his anthropological conceptions are Feuerbachian transformations of what they thought Hegel's answer is to the relation between human beings having a body, being animals on the one hand, and being mental entities, uh, being parts of subjectivity and being also part of the realm of the conceptual structures. And the fourth thing is that Marx wants to use Hegel's logic for developing a critical social theory. Um, when we read his critique of what the political economy of his times is doing wrong. They are not wrong with collecting data, but they do have the wrong idea what a theory has to do. And in the Grundrisse and later, Marx is working with the notion of totality in which concepts, conceptual structures are developed via a conceptual process. Um, shown in the end that they are forming a kind of totality in which they are all understood as um, a holistic system in which uh, the role of every single part can be understood and analyzed or made explicit by using the other ones. Having this kind of ideal, Marx really is heavily relying on this, on Hegel's notion of what Wissenschaft as system really is. And I think the overall structure in capital and even more clearly in Grundrisse is of this kind. And this means that Marx wants to have a philosophically organized social theory and not a social theory which is following the ideal of normal empirical sciences or something like that. Um, these are the four levels I would suggest to distinguish in his overall thinking and if it comes to his relation to Hegel and um, the questions we have to ask here is what does it really mean when Marx says that there is a transition from idealism to realism? For example, one problem is that if you use the notion of totality, the idea of realism in which you say there is something which is totally independent from conceptual structures seems to be uh, closed directly because realism presupposes that there is something out of, out of reach of the conceptual structures. And, um, the problem here, I think, is the clue here is that you can integrate realistic motives within an overall non or entire realistic structure. And uh, for example, a kind of epistemic resistance and uh, repugnance or something like that. And that it is not persuasive to analyze Hegel's theory as a kind of strong anti-realism, which does not allow realistic elements within it. It's, uh, I think, a common idea of at least Schelling and Hegel, and I think also it's in the uh, uh, dimension of Fichte himself, to overcome somehow the distinction of idealism and realism or objectivism and subjectivism somehow. Um 
I, I'm going to have to remind you that we're at a, a 30 minute mark. So please wrap it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll pre I'm very uh, quick now. And the second problem is that Hegel's social philosophy is meant to better understand the reality to make us accept it, uh, that he, uh, may, uh, Marx is starting as a critical theory, trying to show and demonstrate that, that reality is non-reasonable, has to be overcome. And you find two problems. The first is that Marx himself deals with the problem how to justify that real social phenomena can be understood as realizations of a complex conceptual constellation. Uh, this is in capital the problem that he has a very complicated theory of um, conceptions in the first 100 pages, starting from labor, etc. And he identifies his conceptual developments with real empirical phenomena and his critique of Hegel, how to justify this comes full back to him and it's not solved. And the second is, if you want to transform Hegel, Hegel's conceptions or single conceptions by using a modified Hegelian framework altogether, um, how can this be done? Because we cannot be sure on which level um, he Marx is taking Hegelian resources, uh, in which way he's transforming Hegelian resources, and there he is rejecting Hegelian resources. He made a notice in 1845 that this has to be done if he wants to use Hegelian conceptions by um, transforming them so that they are apt for a good theoretical use, but he never worked that out. And this is why I think there is still an open question how Marx could be a non-Hegelian, Hegelian thinker and relying on a lot of Hegelian conceptions by also arguing for overcoming that systematic idea. Probably one answer simply is that the basic